Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into the word. Heavenly Father, we come by the blood of Jesus. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who takes the things of Christ and makes them known to us. We thank you, Father, for ears to hear and eyes to see what you are saying to us by the Holy Spirit. We thank you again that you have put a treasure inside of each of us in an earthen vessel, that the power may be of God and not of ourselves, who has made us able ministers of the good news of Jesus Christ, not of the letter of the law, but of the Spirit. We thank you again this morning that the yoke is being destroyed because of the power of the anointing on the word. And Father, we welcome you by your spirit to come and teach these things to us, plant these truths deep into the soil of our heart. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who makes known to us the mysteries, the deep things of God. And so we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We can do nothing without you. And we pray that you would uh, open my heart that I might bring forth these truths and plant them deep into the soil of our heart and help us to walk in them and be doers of them in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. Well, uh, I just want to, you know, uh, this goes out on, on YouTube each week, and so I just want to welcome our, our YouTube and Facebook audience. It's good to have you with us. I know I don't talk to you guys enough, but thanks for joining us here at Living Faith Church, and we hope you'll make a comment in the comment section uh, and like this, this video, and uh, you can get information about our website if you're watching on YouTube uh, down in the... Um, comment section you'll see there's links to our website and other uh, resources there so thanks again for joining us and hey it's good to see everybody again today this morning I want to just bring you some words of encouragement some words of faith because if we ever needed to be encouraged it's right now amen a lot of God's people are discouraged and we know the enemy wants to discourage us you know the opposite of courage is discourage and there's two things the devil will try to do the devil will try to distract you or he'll try to discourage you. If he can't distract you, then he'll try to bring discouragement into your life. And we know that story. But I want to encourage you this morning. And the way we stay encouraged is by keeping the main thing the main thing. Amen? So this morning, I'm, our message is called Dealing with the Difficulties of Life. And how many of you are having a few difficulties in your life right now? Uh, those of you watching by Facebook or YouTube, you might be having some difficulties in your life right now. But I want to tell you that before you had a problem, God had an answer. Before there was a, an issue, God had a solution. Amen. Before the foundation of the world, God knew you and called you by name. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, this is the Children's Living Bible. And, uh, uh, and I want to just read this. I like how, how this translation renders this. It says, Regard it all as joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face various kinds of temptations or trials. For you know that the testing of your trust produces perseverance, but let perseverance do its complete work so that you may be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. Amen. So, you know, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is corrupted by sin, a world of darkness. The Bible says that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The entire world we live in, every person outside of Jesus Christ is under the sway and influence of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. This is what the apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. And this is where we used to live our lives before we knew Jesus. And the world is fallen, and because the world is fallen, and because we live in this fallenness and we're dealing with it on a regular basis, uh, we all are going to face circumstances on a regular basis that we have little or no control over. Probably one of the most frustrating things that we're dealing with right now in our nation is we're facing so many things that in the natural, in a physical aspect, we have very little, if any, control over. But God has control over all things. God can change anything in a moment. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, that the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, subject to change. The things that are not seen are eternal. We spoke about this last week. So the things we're facing, even though in the natural they may seem like they cannot be changed, God can change them. God can turn things around. And God can change the circumstances in our lives. So life can be bitter at times, and it can make you bitter, or it can make you better. The circumstances we face in life will either put you over or put you under. You know, we all face tests and trials, and the Bible here in James says to count it all joy. Consider it pure joy, one translation says, when you come into different trials. 
That's an easy thing to say. It's a difficult thing to do. How many realize it's not always easy to count it all joy when you're facing trouble? Instead, what you want to do is murmur and complain and gripe about it. That's what our flesh wants to do. But the Bible literally says we're to consider it joy. But why are we considering it joy? Well, Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Some people, under, some people think that we're rejoicing for the trouble. Nobody rejoices for the trouble. We're not rejoicing because we have trouble. We're rejoicing because we serve a God that can get us through the trouble. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So we're not rejoicing in problems. We're not rejoicing for the, the problem itself. We're rejoicing in the fact that God has an answer to the problem, that God will preserve us in times of trouble, that he's a very present help in the time of trouble. This is what we're rejoicing in. If we're rejoicing for the trouble, then we're rejoicing because the devil is the author of our trouble oftentimes. We don't want to rejoice in that. But we count it all joy. Why? Because the trying of our faith, the trying and testing of our faith works great endurance. It makes us strong. It, it makes us stronger in God and in the power of his might. And some of you may be saying, man, I must be really strong by now <laughs> because I've been facing a lot of troubles and a lot of trials and tribulation. But you realize that, that even though you're facing those things, those help us to trust God. You know, somebody said a, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. And that's so true. Great faith is not developed without great trials and tests. Great trials come out of great testing of our faith. And that's why we count it all joy. Last week we talked about these different men and women of God who God used mightily, like David who defeated Goliath. Daniel who overcame uh, the mouth of the lions by the grace and power of Jesus Christ, by the power of God. Esther who through the power of God was able to rescue her people. And uh, on and on we go, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who went into the fiery furnace but came out the other side. And yet there are those in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, what we call the Hall of Fame of Faith, who didn't receive deliverance. They were martyred. They were sawn in two. They, were, they faced hardship and difficulties, and they all died in faith. You know, the Bible records those who were martyred, those who suffered, those who had trouble, along with those who were delivered out of trouble. The Bible says that some put whole armies to flight. We know this from, from following after Scripture. But this hasn't always been the case with all people. There are times where people have faced situations and they've been killed for their faith in Christ. And our brothers and sisters all over the world right now are facing such situations where they're losing their homes, they're losing their livelihood, they're losing their very lives for their faith in Jesus Christ. But their eyes aren't fixed upon this world only. Our eyes have to be fixed upon eternity where our ultimate prize is laid up for us. And this is why Jesus said that's where our heart has to be because our treasure is where our heart will be. Amen? So the Bible says here in James chapter 2, let me read to this. This is out of the expanded Bible, and I love this translation. It's somewhat like the Amplified Bible, but a little more uh, expanded even sometimes than the Amplified. And it says, my brothers and sisters, or my fellow believers, when you have many kinds of troubles or trials and test scenes, you should be full of joy and consider it pure joy because you know that these troubles test your faith. And this will give you patience or literally perseverance and endurance. And let your patience or perseverance and endurance show itself perfectly in what you do. Have its full effect or finished work upon you. Then you will be perfect or mature and complete and whole and completely mature. And you will have everything you need or lack nothing. So what's the objective of this? It isn't that God is, is sending these troubles into our lives. But the fact is we live in a fallen world. And because we live in a fallen world, you're not, you don't have to go looking for trouble. Trouble will come looking for you. And because we live in a fallen world, we're just going to have to get our mind around the fact that we're going to face difficulties and troubles. The only way to avoid difficulties and troubles is die and go to heaven, be with Christ. Amen? Because in the world, we're going to face tribulation. Jesus said it. We're going to face trouble. We're going to face problems. And those can come in different forms. They can come in financial issues. They can come into physical issues. People are facing uh, sicknesses. They're facing persecution. They're facing all sorts of uncertainties in this world we live in today. And so the Bible says that this, this testing of our faith causes us to exercise patience or literally the ability to stand firm and steadfast under trial. 
You know, when we, fa- when we face persecution, when we face difficulties, when we face trials in our lives of every sort, it is not the trial itself that we rejoice in again. It's the fact that God is working in that trial and strengthening us. I guarantee you there are things you're facing today that years ago probably would have shipwrecked your faith. But because you've become stronger in your faith by learning to trust God, then we can have confidence in the day of trouble now. Again, remember, remember David when David came in and he was going to fight Goliath. You know, Goliath comes out boasting in the gods of the Philistines and blaspheming the God of heaven. And David is offended. And David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should, he should uh, defile the armies of the living God? And David says, I'll go and fight him. And Saul, King Saul brings David in. And David is just a youth. And David says, I'll go fight him. And of course, Saul, like all people, are looking at David after the natural. They're looking at him as just a young man, not seasoned warrior at all. And he's about to go up against the champion of the Philistines. And not just the champion, but this man who is massive. And what does Saul do? Saul says, you, you have no chance against him. You can't defeat him. And what does David say? When I was tending my father's sheep, a bear came and tried to take one of the lambs, and I killed the bear. And a lion came and tried to take some of the sheep, and I killed the lion. And who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He'll fall before God as well. See, David had real-life experience in seeing God's delivering power. If David had never killed a bear or a lion, we would have had question to wonder you know, whether he was going to be up for the task. But it was because he'd already walked with God, because he'd already seen the hand of God. He'd already seen God deliver him from a lion and a bear. And he'd already seen God's power and realized it was the Lord that gave him the strength. This uncircumcised Philistine, this Goliath, looked to him no different than those challenges. And see, when we walk with God and we remember and recall the things God has done in our life, it helps us to remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Last week we looked at, at um, Paul and Silas when they were arrested for and put in the prison. And at midnight it says they sang praises unto God. What did they do? They did, the, they did exactly what James referred to. They counted it all joy. They rejoiced in the Lord. They praised God. They were praising God for his power. They were praising God for his hand. And what happens? An earthquake comes and delivers them out of the prison and sets them free. Praise be to God. So God can show up in difficult times if we'll remember that. And this is why we need to count it all joy. We need to consider it pure joy when we come into trials, knowing that the trying of our faith causes us to work our faith. And what happens when, when we exercise our faith? Well, it gives, a, it gives God an opportunity to show up and show himself strong on our behalf. Murmuring and complaining and whining never, never brought God on the scene. As a matter of fact, murmuring and complaining and whining in the Old Testament cost an entire generation, thousands of people being murdered, being destroyed, not murdered, but destroyed because of their sin. So we need to be careful that we don't find ourselves murmuring against God. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and this is such an awesome, awesome scripture because Paul, of course, Paul is our champion of people in the New Testament that we could speak of and look to as somebody that really endured incredible difficulties. Paul underwent incredible hardships in his life because of his faith in Christ and his, his uh, following Christ. As a matter of fact, when Paul was first saved on the road to Damascus and the prophet comes to, to Paul to uh, tell him about what God has done, the Lord tells the prophet, tell him what great things he is going to suffer in my behalf. And Paul did suffer amazing things. But yet God was amazing in his life. And look at here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. It says, I rejoiced greatly. This is what Paul says. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. That now at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned about me before, but you had no opportunity to show it. So he's speaking to the church at Philippi that they were able to bring him financial support because this church supported Paul financially in his ministry. He says in verse 11, now that I speak from, excuse me, not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content and self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy, regardless of my circumstances. I know how to get along and have 
live humbly in difficult times, and also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing life, whether well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or being in need. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who influences me with inner strength and confident peace. That's a little bit wordy. That's the Amplified Bible. Of course, Paul said in the King James says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Well, what's the context of this? Even when I'm facing trouble, I can do all things for Christ which strengtheneth me. But look what Paul says, I've learned how to be content in all circumstances. I've learned how to be a base and how to abound. One translation, the 20th century New Testament says, I have learned how to be independent of circumstances. See, I think that's along with what Paul, James was saying, that we count it all joy, that Paul said, I've learned the secret of how to live my life, and that is I live my life in such a way that circumstances do not dictate my attitude, circumstances do not dictate to me my trust or faith in God, but I've learned how to live independent of circumstances. You know, it's easy to rejoice in God when everything's going great. It's easy to rejoice in God when you look at your, your bank account and you've got a bunch of money in it. It's easy to rejoice in God when you feel great in your body, when everything looks like it's going great, it's easy to rejoice in God in those circumstances. But it's an entirely different thing when you look at your bills and you don't seem to have enough money uh, to make ends meet. Or maybe you're facing financial situations in your life that, that you don't really know where you're going to get the resources to pay those bills. Or maybe your body is racked with pain and you're facing all sorts of uncertainty and you're hearing the report of man that this is what man says. You go to the doctor and the doctor brings an evil report into your life that this is in your life and this situation in your life. And it's easy in those situations then to begin to complain or begin to murmur or to get into fear and unbelief or, or worry. And uh, what happens then? Well, we're not counting it all joy. We're not exercising our faith. We're not trusting in God. God. And Paul said, I have learned how to be independent of circumstances. See, we cannot live our lives in such a way where every time the wind blows, it has a devastating effect upon our faith in God. You know, there are a lot of people in America today who will say things like this. Well, you know, I used to live for God. I used to be, you know, I grew up, I went to church. I used to be a Christian, but I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm not following God. And you ask them why? Well, I had all these problems in my life. You know, I had all these problems. And because I had problems, you know, I just, God has disappointed me. Well, that really questions people's faith in that situation. Because really, problems should not drive us from God. Problems should drive us to God. Because God is not our problem. God is our answer. But this, again, goes back to this situation that I've dealt with before, and I, I think it's a bad question to ask ourselves, why is this happening to me? There's a tendency in all of our lives when trouble comes to say, why did this happen to me? Why me, O oh Lord? Or why this person? Well, why not? We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's fallen. But why is a bad question? Because why causes us to question the justice and integrity of God? What we really should be asking ourselves is, what do I do now? What do I do in this circumstances? Have any of you ever had a situation where you prayed about a situation, but it didn't turn out the way you prayed? And you were faced with a choice at that moment. Well, why didn't this work out? I thought I was in faith. I thought God was going to come through. It didn't work out that way. Well, we don't always know all the answers to that because we don't see everything. You know, God sees the beginning from the end. God knows all information, and we're limited in our information. And I don't know why sometimes prayers don't work out the way we prayed. And I don't know why every situation doesn't work out the way we were believing God. But I do know this, that God is faithful. I do know that God is not unjust. And I do know that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I do also know that even in the middle of absolute defeat, God can turn that situation around. I'm convinced 
that God can take anything the devil means for our destruction and turn it around for our good, even the worst situation. So it's not a good question, it's not a good way to live our lives where we're always questioning God because the devil will jump right in there and the devil will accuse God of being unjust. Well, if God loved you, why did he answer that prayer? If God loved you, if God is good, why is that happening? Well, what is he basically saying? He's accusing God, isn't he? I don't know. But I think we have to assume the posture that Job had. And one of the things we learn from Job, Job is not really a good book to form doctrine on. But Job is a good book to form faithfulness on. One of the things Job teaches us is a man who was patient in difficulties, in hardships. You know, and Job's friends all abandoned him. He lost his family. He lost all of his kids. He lost everything. And not only that, he was afflicted with heinous sores and pain in his body. And then all of his friends come over, and instead of encouraging Job, they ridicule him, and they accuse him of being sinful. They say, well, Job, the reason you're suffering these afflictions is because obviously you're a man full of sin in your life, and if you'd repent and turn back to God and get out of this pride... God would heal you, but the reason you're being afflicted is God is trying to teach you something through this because you're in sin. And Job defends his righteousness. Job says, I'm not unjust. And Job was a righteous man. But God turns the situation around, but before that, even Job's wife comes in and says, why don't you just curse God and die? And that's a good wife, isn't it? (laughs) I'm glad my wife never said that to me. Amen. Why don't you just curse God and die, Job? I mean, even his own wife had abandoned him. But Job said, you speak like a foolish woman. Even though he slay me, yet will I praise him. You know, Job had less revelation than any of us about who God was and what the scripture says. Job is the oldest book in the entire Bible. And yet Job had greater revelation of God's faithfulness than many Christians in today's era do. Because Job recognized that his answer was God. And God was not to blame for his problems. And Job stood faithful. And even though Job had an encounter with God where God calls Job on the carpet and answers him things that Job cannot speak, God restores Job's life. And it says the latter time, the latter end of Job's life was better than the former. He was more more wealthy. He had a better life at the end of his days than he did before. So God took what the devil had meant for Job's destruction and turned it around in a moment and brought glory about it. And so I believe God can do that in any circumstance. And even the worst thing that could happen in our lives is what? We would die? And even death is swallowed up in victory. So we can't lose. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So, you know, for a Christian to become bitter at God because maybe we lose a loved one or something who's a believer... That's no reason to get bitter at God. They're with Christ. They wouldn't come back if you begged them to come back. They've laid their burden down. This is the whole purpose we're living our lives is to one day step into eternity and finish our race. Now, of course, we want to fight the good fight of faith. We have a purpose and we have a destiny. We have things we need to accomplish right here and now. And so, yeah, we want to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold upon eternal life. But Paul said, I've learned how to be content in any circumstance. I've learned how to live my life independent of circumstances. So in other words, when I have an abundance, because he's talking here specifically about financial resources, so when I have an abundance, I live the same way as if I didn't have an abundance. I'm in want and lack. There are some Christians that if they won the lottery, they would be backslidden next week because their life's not living this way. They're living based on circumstances. When things are going great, they're all for living for God. When things are going bad, they're backslidden. Or the other way around. When things are bad, they'll follow after God and seek God because I need God. And then when everything's going great, like, well, I don't need God anymore. So they're up and down and in and out and here and there all the time. We need to learn to live a consistent life. A walk with the Lord. You know, we don't run through the valley of the shadow of death. We walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Our Christian life is one of consistent living day by day without highs and lows and all of this roller coaster type of thing. That's what is a sign of a maturing Christian. 
that we're not just blown all over by our emotions, especially in this culture right now, because we live in a culture right now that is just full of emotion, where people have lost the ability to even think. Everything's emotion. Oh, I don't like this, or I like this. It's not based upon reality. It's based upon emotions. And we need to live a life not based on emotion. God will give us emotion. Thank God for emotions. Emotions come from God, but we can't be dictated to by emotions because they're, they're unreliable. If you're living only by how you feel, the devil will take full advantage of that. How do you feel? I love what Smith Wigglesworth said. He said, I never ask Smith Wigglesworth how he feels. I tell him how he feels. I don't ask his opinion about how he feels. But often we're very feely. Well, how do you feel? What's your feeling about? Well, your feelings, let me just say this. This is a great thing. This will help you a lot. And I remember this years ago. You cannot feel your way to better living, but you can live your way to better feeling. See, a lot of people are waiting for their feelings to get better, and then they'll be like, oh, I'm healed, or I'm this, I'm that. You cannot feel your way into a better state of mind. But your feelings, your emotions, will follow your faith. And this is what he's talking about. Count it all joy when you fall into different trials. You might be facing some really difficult trials, and if you go by your feelings, your feelings are going to shipwreck your faith. So what do we do? We walk by faith. Father, I thank you that even though I'm facing this circumstance, even though I'm facing these difficulties, you're with me, you're for me, you haven't forsaken me. You're going to work this together for my good. You're going to work these things out. And you might have to do that all day long, from the rising of the sun to the time that it goes down. Because the voice of faith is the voice of praise. See, praise, faith doesn't wait. Faith doesn't wait till all the stars and planets align and everything's perfect to thank God for the answer. Faith thanks God for the answer and the victory while we're in the lion's den, while we're heading toward the fiery furnace. When everything around us looks like it's falling apart, faith gives voice to praise. Faith gives thanks to God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So faith is constantly giving the report of praise and thanksgiving. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. It doesn't look like I got enough to meet my financial needs, but I thank you for more than enough to meet my need. That my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I thank you that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or maybe you're dealing with sickness in your body. Father, I thank you that I'm healed even though I feel sick. I thank you that I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus and you sent forth your word and healed me even though my body is telling me this. I don't care what my body is saying. I'm calling my body into alignment and I'm calling these circumstances into alignment with you. So I thank you and I praise you. Or maybe you're having all sorts of other problems. Will you just thank you, Father, that, that you're with me and for me and you're going to be my, my vindicator. You're going to turn these things around in my life and I thank you for it so we have to give praise and voice to that thanksgiving before we see the answer because if you're waiting for the answer to come around and then you'll thank God then you really aren't believing God are you you know all the things we're seeing in our country right now we just need to thank God that God's still on the throne amen and God has heard the prayers of his people and God is moving even in the middle of difficult situations, God is with us, God is for us, and we will not give place to fear. We will not give place to discouragement because we have a kingdom that's not of this world. We have a kingdom that is eternal. Amen? And we set our eyes upon that, and we set our eyes upon Jesus Christ. So Paul said, I've learned how to live independently of circumstances. And right now, I think we need to learn how to live independently of what circumstances are dictating to us, that we just need to trust God in the middle of trouble. Amen? I will not be moved by what I see. I'm moved by faith in God. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I think one of the things we have to recognize, and Paul dealt with this a lot, Jesus dealt with it a lot, and that's keeping our priorities straight. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you've got your Bible, or you can follow along in your notes as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Apostle Paul here, and he's saying basically a very similar thing that Jesus said over in the Gospel of Matthew. But the Apostle Paul is speaking to Timothy, who is his son in the faith. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, let's look at verse 6, and we're going to read down through verse 19. And again, I have the uh, New Living Translation here. 
But let's see what Paul said about this. He says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. That sounds a lot to me like what Paul said about living independently of circumstances, right? So godliness with contentment is of great wealth. There's one thing we really need to recognize in this nation is Americans need to understand that contentment is what we're after, not happiness. Happiness, even though the word blessed really in its basic form means happy, but really what we're looking for and want in our lives is contentment. I mean, you could have a lot of money and not be very content because Americans have more money than anybody on the planet compared to the other countries. But yet a lot of Americans are not content because they haven't learned how to live a contented life. And contentment isn't based upon, again, as Paul said, it's not based upon your outward circumstances. It's based upon your relationship with God. So it goes on here. After all, we brought nothing into this world. We brought nothing when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Now that flies right in the face of this consumeristic culture we live in, right? That in order to be happy, you have to have the latest smartphone. You have to have the latest automobile. You have to have the best clothes. You have to have this and that. It's a constant feeding of discontentment. This idea that I have to have more. And what do we see? It doesn't make people happy. It may for a moment. It has a momentary gratification, but it's very fleeting. There was an article I read years ago. It says, since we have, since we have so much, why are we so unhappy? I mean, suicide is through the roof in America, and it has been for some time. The, one of the top killers of youth in America right now is suicide. Why would, why would young people that have their entire life ahead of them and have so much, the most prosperous, blessed generation ever in the history of the world economically is youth today. Why would they be so discouraged and so despondent why would so many young people be willing to kill themselves and end their life when they've got everything going for them? Well, we could say there's lots of reasons behind that, but it proves the point. And what is the point? It proves that materialism is a very shallow God. That materialism really does not bring inner contentment. If anything, actually what it does is it can cause problems in our lives because we, lear we learn to live in a way that we're always looking for something outside of ourselves or beyond God to bring us gratification. And, you know, sin, sin only goes so far and it becomes boring. And materialism only goes so far and, and we're always, it's like a drug that we need a new fix. I got to have a new fix. And people are constantly looking for something else to fulfill that void. But Paul said the godliness with contentment is of great wealth. Knowing you're right with God and knowing that if you were to die today, heaven would be your home brings great contentment into your life, or it should. This is why when you talk to people in developing nations, uh, I mean, it's, it's almost inevitable when, when you have Americans who go to other countries and I, I've seen this on the mission field a number of times, but, but many times when, when people from the West will go to other countries and they'll see people in developing nations, Christians who are so dirt poor, I mean literally have nothing, and yet they'll go, these people are happy. They don't have anything. Everything's hard physically and materially. I mean, they don't have luxuries. And yet they're happy. They're happier than I am. And why? Because they learned how to be content with what they have. They, number one, they don't live in a culture that is always feeding them materialism. That's always telling them that they got to be, the only to be happy, you have to have something new. And so they learn how to live where they're at, and they're content with that. Which shows how shallow materialism really is, and yet we've been so inundated with materialism for decades that we don't even know how it, to live without it. But really, how much do we really need? We need food, we need clothes, and we need shelter. Aren't those really the essentials of what we need in life? And everything beyond that is icing on the cake. 
And so we have to, I think we have to consciously, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I think we have to consciously really be aware of this and made aware of it because otherwise we'll fall prey to the same thing the world around us is. And we're always looking for something out here to bring us contentment and joy, but it can never do that. And that's what Paul was talking about. Paul's talking about living independently of these things around us. So in verse eight, verse 8, so if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Verse 9, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now, let me just bring a little perspective here because it's very easy for people to read this and go, oh, you see these rich people over here, uh, they're bad people because they're after money. But you can be dirt poor and have the same attitude. It's not about whether you have material wealth. It's about where your attitude is toward it because there are plenty of people right now who are very poor materially or financially, economically, yet they're constantly playing the lottery games. They're constantly going to the casinos because they think someday I'm going to win that jackpot. Somebody said that uh, the lottery is basically a tax on poor people. And I don't know about you, and if you play the lottery, I'm not crit criticizing you or condemning you, but I've been into a number of gas stations over the years, and you got some guy or, or gal that you, you know, by looking at them from a material perspective, you kind of guess, like, they're not rolling and they're not driving a Rolls Royce. And they're up there scratching those lottery tickets off four or five at a time trying to win five bucks. And I realize that, you know, I'm not condemning people for doing that. If you play the lottery, you know, again, people waste money in all sorts of means, and some people actually win once in a while. Studies have shown that most people that win the lottery end up in worse condition financially than they were before. Have you ever noticed somebody that has gained a lot of money in a hurry who never had much money? What happens to them? They end up broke. I remember a family I met years ago came to me on a Sunday one time and um, had come to church and they wanted to talk to me afterwards and they were talking about all this financial problems they'd had in their lives and uh, they were, their gas was, they were out of propane and they needed help and they were wondering if we would help them with their propane bill. And I said, well, you know, I'll be glad to meet with you and we'll see where things are at. So I met with them the next day and they told me the story of how somebody in their family had left them $50,000 and um, the year before. And, um, and I started kind of putting, and $50,000 is not a lot of money. We realize that it's, it's not. But, but you start kind of putting the dots together as I was talking to this family, and you realize the problem was that you don't know how to handle any money. And, you know, here you are, you you spent your money on this and wasted money on this and wasted money on this and now it's winter and you don't have any money to put propane in your tank. You know, the irony of this story is, you know, as a pastor, you want to help people. You want to be merciful to people. And, uh, but the truth is, people also need to learn how to manage their lives. You know, I've, I've dealt with people over the years, like they'll call up the church and say, hey, you know, my electric's going to get shut off next week. And you say, well, how much money do you do? Well, I got a $700 electric bill. Like, oh, that's a lot, quite a bit of money, huh? And then you find out, well, I'm going to have to follow up on this to make sure your story is legitimate. And you call the power company. They go, well, they've done this every year for the last 10 years. What happened in the summer when your electric bill wasn't $700? Well, we were just spending money. And uh, so... The truth is you want to help people, but you also don't want to be a sucker. And you don't want to be taken advantage of. Because if I give you $700 to pay your electric bill, I could easily give this to somebody over here that was responsible and they really genuinely need the help. And they aren't every year calling everybody to pay their electric bill because they're irresponsible. Do you understand that story? So the point is there are legitimate needs. You want to help people with legitimate needs. But going back to this story, I think that goes back to this, this whole aspect that Paul is trying to bring here that we didn't bring anything into this world. We're not taking anything with us. So we need to stop living as if we're living forever and ever and ever. 
You know, you can't take it with us. <laughs> Again, you know, I talk about this all the time. Uh, material things, and, and I don't mean to harp on this, but it, it's, it's since we're on this in this message here, uh, I've always made contended that estate sales are the epitome of how materialism is so futile. I mean, think about estate sales. How many of you have ever been to an estate sale? And what's an estate sale? It's somebody selling off your stuff after you die. And what are estate sales like? Well, basically, you take everything the person, and it's out in the yard. Their dressers are out in the yard. Their beds are out in the yard. Everything's out in the yard. The dishes, the things they used all through their life, they're out for everybody to walk through their house and look at it. So what do you see? You see these things that people stored and kept. And we've, you know, I've been to estate sales where people never got rid of anything. And it's just so much stuff out in the middle of the yard and in their house. It's just amazing. Like, man, this person had a lot of stuff. What were they doing with all this stuff? They were wasting their life taking care of stuff until somebody, they died. And so what happens, all those things that they may have considered so valuable when they die, when they were alive, suddenly they're not valuable to anybody anymore. And it's just such an irony, and it's what, Paul, what, uh, what, what um, Solomon was talking about in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, <clears throat> he said, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're smart or stupid, whether you're, whether you're famous or infamous, uh, it doesn't matter because in the end you're going to die, and then it's all a chasing after the wind. And that was one of the consternations of Solomon. He said, you know, I've got a lot of wealth. And he says, who knows if my children, my sons, will take good care of this wealth. They could go out and waste it. Right? And so that was what he was basically saying is that although we need to be good stewards, we have to recognize that this temporal world is fleeting. And so we have to make sure that we're always keeping the main thing the main thing and not getting our affections too readily ingrained on just material wealth and material things and this here and now because we're here today, we're gone tomorrow. Our life is very short. And, and we have to live our lives in such a way that we're living for eternity. As Paul said, we brought nothing into this world. You came into the world naked, we're leaving the world naked. Amen? We came into the world with nothing, we're leaving the world with nothing. And the only thing we're leaving the world with is eternity or not eternity. And all the things we've done or haven't done for Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, let's go on and we'll swing over here. Uh, let's look over to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. Because... Jesus is saying basically the same thing here. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in to steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye, and therefore your eye is, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if the eye is bad, your whole body will be filled with darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for you will either hate the one and love the other for you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, again, let me just contextualize this because people can read this and go, oh, well, money, it's, it's bad. Paul, Paul said the love of money is the root of all evil. But we realize we live in a culture, in a society where money is essential. Amen? And this isn't about whether you're wealthy or not wealthy. You know, Everybody, the truth is, we go and give a great portion of our lives to earn money so we can pay our bills and survive. And we can give to other people and help them. The Bible says, in all labor, there is profit. So the Bible is not against money. God made Abraham very wealthy. God made David very wealthy. So the Bible isn't against money. The love of money is what God is against. Money outside of the context of God's kingdom. In other words, money that enslaves you and it becomes your God. It becomes something that you're inordinate affections toward. And that's true about anything. So it isn't as if he's saying here, well, we should just avoid money. You cannot avoid money. Not in this culture. And if you're a businessman, you know, the objective of being a business person is what? Making money. Because if you're not making money, you're bankrupt, right? Right? So the context of what he's talking about here isn't a, the, the, the aspect of, you know, you should just forget about earning any money. 
This is not what he's talking about here. <clears throat> what he's talking about in the context of here is that we cannot serve money. We cannot serve materialism and God. We cannot serve the things of this world in our heart and passion, be only in this earth and serve God at the same time. So he's really talking about right priorities here is what he's talking about. He's talking about a heart being in God's heaven, in God's kingdom. I was just reading, a, <clears throat> listening to a, 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 I was listening to a testimony this morning about this young guy that he was raised in a church and when he became, he was in the worship team, played in the worship team when he was a young kid growing up and uh, when he got to be 18, he, he, he left home and got involved with a rock and roll band and became, you know, got into the party life and sin living. And he said, I would go to strip clubs all the time. And I was into pornography and playing in bands. And I partied all the time. And he said uh, he, had a, he had a situation in his life where he realized his life was going nowhere. And he was you know, again, the emptiness of materialism. It's like the prodigal son who came to himself one day and realized he was eating pig slop. And he said, I started looking into organizations. I wanted to get, and he wasn't really, he wasn't, he said, I wanted to go back to the faith of my fathers, the faith I had before when I was young because I realized I was hung, I was happy. I had some contentment. And he said, everything I was after wasn't giving me contentment. So through a series of events, he began to look into organizations that he could go and get involved with as a volunteer. But when he They'd ask him to get involved, and he'd fill out his life story about how he was just living so riotous. They didn't really want anything to do with him because he was, you know, they looked at him as like, he looked like a reprobate. Well, finally, he got involved with this, this organization, which is like doctors, uh, open borders, you know, doctors who go to other countries, and they, they uh, I think it was Mercy Ships is actually what it was, which is these doctors that go to other countries, and they do operations on people who have serious deformities and so on. And he said, I, I went on board to, to be a, a film director that I would document what they were doing and film it and so on. And basically what he found out is he said, what I saw when I went, I went to Liberia with them, which is the poorest country in the entire world, one of the poorest countries, the poorest country in all of the continent of Africa. And he said, I was not prepared for what I was going to see and encounter. And he talked about <clears throat> people with growths on their face that were massive. And he said, um, people would come, and it was my responsibility, <clears throat> as I went along, I was documenting this, but it was part of my responsibility with this team to determine who could come in and see the doctor and have an operation and who could not. And he said, these people would come. There was one particular place where people would walk for two months to get to see these doctors because there's so few doctors. And he said, we had so many people, there was no way possible for, all, for these doctors to operate on all of these people and said we literally had to turn thousands of people away because there just was no way we could possibly serve all of these people. But yet he told stories of the people that were admitted of surgery. This one particular man, he was literally suffocating because he had a, a tumor that was growing off of his eye. It was literally about this big and it was suffocating him. And he told the story and filmed the documentary of this man, young, this man being transformed by surgery. And, and of course, <clears throat> it's no different in these countries than it is in, in the United States. Uh, some countries such as this, it was, you know, you look at this and they considered something, you were under some sort of curse and you were considered a freak of nature and nobody wanted to have anything to do with you because your, your growth was so heinous. And the man's life was transformed. And he said, I had the privilege of taking him back to his village after all the surgeries and presenting his new face and showing his village, this is the man whose life has now been transformed and he can live a normal life again. But see, those type of things, and what he was pointing out was when you are encountering these type of things, and he started talking about how <clears throat> more people die in the world from dirty water, drinking dirty water, and bathing in dirty water than all of the wars combined in the world. It's the number one killer of people worldwide is dirty water. And yet there are people all over the world today where young girls and boys will walk 10, 15 miles, spend their entire day walking and getting water to carry it back to their family so their family can just survive. And so one of the things this young man worked on was to develop a, a, a ministry to raise money to build and, and drill wells and dig wells for people. 
I mean, these are things that we take so for granted and yet so essential. But what he was basically saying is when he, you could hear the passion in his voice, that this brought him such joy and contentment. Why? Because he was lifting people. He was helping people. See, that's what really gives us contentment is when lives are changed and transformed. See, all the, all the wealth and materialism Americans we accumulate and we chase after, it is so empty. It is so empty. And that's why I think Americans, for the most part, a lot of Americans are just not very happy people because they're not spending their lives on things that have real impact in the world that's really transformational. But when we do, when we see people's lives change, and we see the joy of God. You know, I think of our dear brother, David Pulagalo from India, who, you know, is this minister lives out in basically a small village. But, but when you think of the impact you're having on this man's life, that we're able to buy a few coats for people so they aren't frozen during the winter. You can buy some blankets for people. You can feed a few people. It's a vast world with vast needs out there. We can't help everybody, but you can help somebody. We can do our part. And even though it may be, a, it's like... Corey Ten Boom said, said, it's like a teaspoon in the proverbial ocean, but yet it's a teaspoon that wouldn't be there. Like the story of the young boy who came out to the beach one day and the beach was lined with starfish, thousands of starfish that had come up on the beach and they were dying. And the young boy was there and he would throw the starfish back in the ocean and some man came up and said, what are you doing? He said, there's so many starfish, you're wasting your time. He said, I may, it may seem that way, but I'm saving some. I'm doing my part. And sometimes you may seem like a small fish in a big ocean, and literally we are when we consider the great vastness of the world and the need of the world. But God doesn't look at how the, he doesn't look at the quantity, he looks at the quality. He looks at what you are doing, that you're doing something to lift needs and hurt, lift hurting people and lift people out of darkness. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven because these are the type of things that literally are storing up treasures that last forever. That car we're driving, it'll be a rust bucket in a few years. That home we're living in, you're going to die and it's going to go to ruin or somebody else is going to take it. Everything we're doing right now has a temporalness to it. It's temporary in the physical realm. And that's why to live only for the temporal realm, the physical realm, is of all things a waste of our society, a waste of our time, excuse me, if it doesn't have God involved with it. God has to be an integral part of our lives. And this is what Jesus went on to say, verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothing to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than they, than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? Now again, Jesus here is not saying don't make any plans, don't store, don't save. He's not saying that not saying that at all what he's really saying is don't worry don't fret about it don't make it your top priority in life don't be consumed with this because birds aren't and yet God is saying God loves you much more than he does birds and if he takes care of them he will take care of you he's talking about trust in verse 28 he says and why worry about your clothing look at the lilies of the field how they grow they don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have such little faith? So what's he talking about here? He's talking about faith in God, trust in God, confidence in God. And that's why Paul said, I've learned how to be content in all situations. And he goes on in verse 31. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. So again, just what I'm talking about, these are the things the material world around us is continually and completely consumed with. I mean, if you want to see the epitome, just watch late night television. Oh my gosh, talk about plastic, shallow lives. And yet, we're constantly 
given like Hollywood as something we're to emulate, like, oh, this is how I want to, I want to be like these rich and famous stars. If, if, if that means having that shallow of a life, hit me in the head with a baseball bat and put me out of my misery. Because these people, if, if that's their lives, are about as plastic and shallow as lives can be. I mean, I don't even want to go down that road because I'll go on a tangent if I get into it. But see, this is the epitome of the world is always telling us this is, really, this is what you really want to emulate. This is what you want to be like. You know, for instance, uh, I used to watch once in a while, used to watch the Today Show, <clears throat> which at one time was a news program. Now it's basically about as frivolous as can be. And I remember there was a segment in there where they go, what's trending on Twitter today? And it was inevitably some plastic, worthless, insignificant thing. One minute we're reporting about a bunch of people are killed in a plane crash or some tragic event, and then it's what's trending on Twitter, as if they're equal. But yet this is the mixed message Americans are constantly being told, that we can't discern what's of real value from what's trivial. And that's really what, uh, in the wonderful book, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman, that was written clear back in the 60s before television became prominent, Neil Postman warned that the time would come in America where Americans could no longer discern what was of value from what was frivolous. And he pointed out the word muse means to think deeply about or to ponder. The word amuse means to give no thought at all. And his point was we are amusing ourselves to death where the time would come where people would become so mindless that they could no longer to value what was of eternal value of any sort. And so this is what Jesus is really talking about. So don't worry about your lives. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Keep the main thing the main thing. And what's the main thing? To seek God and to follow after Christ and to keep his kingdom as the main perspective in our lives. We have to have heaven's perspective. We have to have heaven's understanding. Well, we could share a lot more about this, but I want to just wrap it up this morning with this. <clears throat> the real way we do this is by keeping God's word in our hearts, by hiding God's word in our hearts. So the way we know what's important to God is by looking at his word, because God gives us what's important in his word. And let's look over at one more scripture here in, J in Matthew chapter 7. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 24 through 28, and says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So Jesus didn't really teach a lot of things that were not found in the Old Testament. He expounded on things that were already there, and he gave us greater revelation of things that were already there. But it wasn't as if Jesus was bringing something completely brand new that had never been heard before. He was just giving us more revelation of what was already available. So when we talk about Jesus saying, whoever hears these sayings of mine, he's not just talking about his sayings alone. He's talking about the principles we find throughout Scripture. And he says, those who hear these sayings, these things I teach and the things that are being heard, and they obey them or they're obedient and do them, they're like a wise man building his house upon the rock. For the floods came and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So the difference here that he's referring to is those who do what the Bible says to do. They're obedient as those who only hear what the Bible says. And he goes on here and he says, but everyone, verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished as his, at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. 
So again, Jesus is talking about obedience to what the word of God says. You can sit here and hear this this morning, but if you do nothing with it and don't act upon what you're hearing, and, act, and what I've been sharing you is right out of the word of God, but if we don't live our lives in such a way that aligns with that and obey it, then it will do nothing in our lives. Like, oh, that was good. No, I'm not going to do anything. And we go right back into living the way we were. Why did Jesus give us these admonitions? So we could do them, right? And what does that mean in your own life? How do we adjust our lives in such a way that treasures are in heaven? That we're not living for right here and now. Colossians chapter 3 says, Let heaven fill your thoughts. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Because why? Because the earth we live in is very temporary. We only got 80 to 100 maybe a little over 100 years on this planet, and then it's eternity. We're all one heartbeat away from eternity at all times. So we want to make sure that we're living in such a way that heaven is our home and, and that we're living in such a way that we're going to make the greatest impact for God's kingdom and, and win as many people to Christ and help as many people and obey God to the degree we can. And again, James, James was conferring what Jesus said. James said, if we say we have faith and do not have corresponding actions, then our faith is vain and foolish. It's useless. Faith without corresponding actions is dead being alone. If we say we love God, but we don't keep his commandments, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. If we say love God and we, we're following after Jesus, but our life has nothing that reflects that, if there's no proof or evidence of what we profess, then really our faith is in vain. So James said, faith without corresponding actions, faith that does nothing is worth nothing. So if our faith does nothing, if our trust in God is really neutral or not doing anything, evident of our faith, then our faith is wasted. And we have a lot of people today that profess to be Christians, but you can't tell they're a Christian by their, by their behavior. Our lifestyles have to align with what we profess to know and believe. And so all of what we're saying here today, if you think about it, it all basically, and, and there's so much more we could talk about here, but our time is up. All of this really is saying the same thing over and over and over. Paul said, I've learned how to be content in any circumstances I'm facing. Why? Because he's walking by faith, not by sight. He's exercising what he professes. Peter, Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, but lay up, or, or on earth, excuse me, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Don't spend all of your time and energy with just the things down here that consume our thoughts and energies, but live in such a way that your life is going to have an eternal reward. There's something you're going to be able to take with you beyond the grave. You can't take your house with you. You can't take your car with you. We can't even take our bank accounts with us. But we can take people. We can impact lives. We can lift people's lives. A study was shown years ago that the most introverted person on this planet will impact no less than 10,000 people in their lifetime. I remember what Daisy Osborne used to say, find a need and heal it. Find a life and heal it. Find a need and meet it. Find a life and lift it. Think about that on your daily life. Here's a good little exercise we could do. You know, when we go through life, we could... We might be in a bad mood, might be having different things, but, you know, it takes less energy to bless people than it does to be grumpy. How many of you, you go into a store, meet somebody, and they're always grumpy? You know, when you go into a store or you go into a place and you deal with a clerk and they're, they're grouchy or they're, people are rah, 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 rah. You know what? It takes less energy to be happy and bless people. Hey, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Hey, you know what? Jesus loves you. Say something nice to somebody. Have a positive attitude. Smile, it increases your face value. Amen? That's something we can exercise that's just very simple, but just lifting people's lives on a regular basis. I mean, we live in a very downer world right now. People are down. People are beat up and beat down by COVID and economic issues and government issues and every sort of issue people are dealing with right now. Let's be people that lift people's lives. You know, we're, we're entering in this week when we start the, this week starts Hanukkah, which is the festival of lights and it corresponds with Christmas and it's called the Feast of Dedication and it's, it's specifically about light, light coming into the world and in the Feast of Hanukkah, uh, 
every day you write, light another candle of the menorah, and the idea is as you light each light, it increases the light in the house, and it's a symbol of how God's light comes into the world, and it begins to increase. And so in our lives, one of the things about Christmas and Hanukkah that correspond with one another, they're both festivals about light. And Jesus said, you're the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So I'll just challenge you this morning as we close, how can you lift people's lives this week, this month? You know, uh, think of the, you know, one of my favorite stories and movies I love to watch at Christmas time is The Christmas Carol, which was written by Charles Dickens. And The Christmas Carol is one of the most famous novels ever written. And on the day when Charles Dickens wrote The Christmas Carol, he finished it right before Christmas, and when he wrote The Christmas Carol, the, the book, um, every copy was sold. And when people read that book, it said charitable giving skyrocketed because people's hearts were convicted about taking care of their fellow human beings. Well, you know what? We need to be reminded of that more than just at Christmas time. You know, there's a line, famous line in the Christmas Carol that goes, Christmas should be a time of year, a festive time of year, when men open their shut-up hearts to be concerned about their fellow human beings. And I've always considered that is really the spirit of God in Christmas because it's the festival of lights. And I know Christmas can be a very difficult time for people. People can suffer depression and not all families growing up were happy families at Christmas. I get that. And people losing loved ones, it's a very difficult time. But I just want us to challenge us to, to consider this time of the year as a feast of dedication as we, as we reflect upon this year. And this, may, you know, this has been a difficult year, 2020, for people emotionally and spiritually in a lot of different ways. But we still need to be about our Father's business of helping people and blessing people and lifting people. And even if it's an encouraging word to a a, a wandering soul, you might be the only encouragement that that person has had in months. You might be the person who determines whether that person goes home and puts a gun to their head or decides to continue to live. Those are heavy things, but it's true. So let's be those who encourage people. Let's be those who lift our fellow man. Let's be those who do the works of Christ and love people. We can't always change the whole world, but we can change our world. We can't influence everybody, but we can influence somebody. And in do so, so doing, we can be the light of Jesus and the love of Jesus to a world around us. So let's close in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you for reminding us, Father, that we have a greater calling than just ourselves. And you've called us to help the world and to lift the world and to make sure that you are our top priority in your kingdom and serving people and lifting people is our top priority. And Father, we pray that you'll give us a greater awareness of this on a regular basis, that you would help us to always be aware of others before ourselves in our fellow men. I just want to say to those you watching on uh, our video today, if you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, we want to give you an opportunity to do so. If you've never called upon Jesus, the Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. First and foremost, if you haven't surrendered to Jesus, the light of Christ isn't in your life. You're living in darkness, and that's how I was before I knew Jesus. And that's how the whole world is. So at this time of year of light and festivities, why not let the light of Jesus into your life? If you're suffering from depression, you're suffering from agony, you're suffering from all these things, perhaps the real problem is that you need God in your life. And everything you're chasing after is not fulfilling or giving you contentment. So we're going to pray this morning to surrender to your life to Christ. If you're willing to surrender, you're willing to turn from your sin and give your life to Jesus Christ, he'll be there for you. So I'm going to pray with you today, and all of you here today, if you'd pray along with me, we'll just pray this together out loud. Say, oh God, I ask your forgiveness because I've sinned against you and I am willing and ready to surrender to you. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins and was raised from the dead according to the scripture. 
and according to what I believe, from this moment forward, I renounce my sin, I turn from the darkness, and I surrender to Jesus. I give you my life. I believe you were raised up, and I confess that Jesus Christ is now my Lord and my Savior in Jesus' name, and I will live for you from this day forward. Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you. If you prayed that prayer, contact us via our Facebook or our, our YouTube channel or our email there, and we'd be glad to send you some materials and help you out any way we can and pray with you. Well, blessings on you guys. We love you very much. Thanks for coming this morning. And uh, why don't you stand your feet? Let me pray over you and just bless you as you're about ready to go. Father, we bless the people. We thank you and praise you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.